When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Skims or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout all birds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash income. Earning your degree online doesn't mean you have to go about it alone. At Capella University, we're here to support you when you're ready. From enrollment counselors who get to know you and your goals, to academic coaches who can help you form a plan to stay on track. We care about your success and are dedicated to helping you pursue your goals. Going back to school is a big step, but having support at every step of your academic journey can make a big difference. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Hey friends, I'm Rachel Grohl and I'm your host for the Hearing Jesus podcast, where I help you to know God and to make him known. Today we are finishing up Mark chapter 2 and we're going to start actually in on the beginning part of Mark chapter 3. If you're just joining us, we are going through the Gospel of Mark in a series that I'm calling Pressing In. And the reason why I chose that is because of similar to what we've been talking about the last couple of days and what we're going to be talking about today, the way that Jesus calls us to press in into our relationship with him and into the kingdom of God. Mark unpacks that in a pretty incredible way where from the onset of Mark chapter one, it's like go time. And so we're talking about this idea of being all in and, and what it means to really press in. And so today we are continuing with Mark chapter two, about halfway through, and we're going to read a chunk of verses today. And just if you are just joining us and you are brand new to the podcast, welcome. What we're doing is we're taking a spirit-led amount of verses and we're explaining that, the history, the culture, the background, some of the concepts, and then I'm reading it again so we can meditate on God's Word. I'm also creating kids content around the same topics. And so you can use that as a resource in your family to help you all grow together spiritually. We also have additional resources on our Patreon page. It starts at just $5 a month and that gets you ad-free episodes, the family discussion guides, the journal prompts, and a couple other bonus things. And so I am now going to be starting from verse 18. I'm going to read through actually Mark 3 verse 6. It says, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now going into chapter three, another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. 
Now, in the beginning portion of this passage, in the part where it's talking about fasting, I actually talked a lot more about that when we did this section of scripture in the book of Matthew. And so if you would like more information or more teaching on the fasting aspect of this passage, you can go back and listen to that episode. But what I will say is that this is consistent with what we've been seeing so far, everything in the last couple of days we've been talking about. Jesus is not, quote unquote, behaving well enough, according to these religious leaders. He isn't acting religious. Well, according to them, he isn't. But what's ironic is that he actually is acting religious according to God's standard. It just looks different than they thought it should. He is putting God's heart above man's rules. And, you know, I I don't have this written down in my notes, but one of the things that this reminds me of is a season in my life where we started a ministry to the strip clubs. And, you know, in other countries, that might look like ministry in the anti-trafficking industry, it would be maybe going to the red light district and rescuing girls off the street. In America, it looks a little bit different. And so me and a couple other pastors, wives, and some key volunteers, we started this ministry to some of the local strip clubs in our area. And um, that got a lot of people really, really upset really, really quickly. And we saw a lot of really amazing things come out of that ministry. We saw women get out of that industry. We saw owners of those establishments uh, get prayer and get saved. We even saw one of the establishments close up shop and they sold it and it's now a restaurant. Um, We've seen some pretty incredible things where Jesus brought freedom into some of the darkest places in our community. But I remember when we first started that, it sent the religious leaders, not our church, but the religious leaders in the community, berserko, the fact that I would dare to go into that quote unquote den of iniquity. And, you know, one of the things I love about Jesus is he doesn't shy away from the darkness. He takes the light into the darkness, which is what we're called to do as well. And so as I was just reading that right now or going through that right now, that's really just immediately what popped up into my heart. And you know what? I love the fact that Jesus doesn't act quote unquote, religious, according to their standards. He does it according to God's standards. And the ironic thing is he is acting religious, but they don't recognize that because it looks different than they thought it should. But again, he's putting God's heart for humankind above the religious rules from these religious leaders. The things that they thought he should do, he didn't do. And the things that they thought he shouldn't do, he did do. And That kind of gives you a clue as to how backwards things had become in that culture by that time. And I do want to give them a little bit of grace in the sense of, I think that their intentions were to be in right relationship with God. I think sometimes that happens. I think sometimes we can start off with the right intentions, but we can quickly get off track. And I think the only antidote for that is to keep our eyes on Jesus now, in that their situation, they had blinders on. They could not see him. They could not see him for what he was. Even though he was doing miracle after miracle, they f- were threatened by that, which I think is an indication of pride. But, you know, in our context, the way that we guard against that is by keeping our eyes on him. What I do want to talk for a minute about is this idea of wine skins. And I want to explain that a little bit. So verse 21 and 22 says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. I was not, again, I was not originally going to talk about this, but as I was praying before the episode started, I really just felt impressed on my spirit to kind of unpack this a little bit. What Jesus is doing here is he's using two very ordinary facts, especially within their culture, to make his point. Now, for us, wineskins sounds weird, but for them, it was a very common thing. What a wineskin was is um, they would literally have these pouches made out of skin. Sometimes it was like the bladder of a goat, or sometimes it was the skin of an animal that they sewed together, and they would store their wine in there. And then the wine, of course, when it's new wine, meaning it's freshly pressed grapes, it goes in there, and then it would ferment. And the fermentation process, in some ways it was a sterilization process because the alcohol would would deal with bacteria and things like that. But um, it's not the same as the alcohol that we drink now. But the point is, is during that fermentation process, it would stretch those wineskins. And being 
natural fibers, they would stretch. After being used for a while, it kind of stretches out a little bit because their garments, of course, it was natural fibers. And so I don't know if you've ever worn it natural fibers, but even something like linen, it's one way when you put it on, it's another way when you take it off. And so what he's talking about is this idea of when those things are brand new, a garment or a wineskin, they're tight. But over time, because of the natural use, they kind of loosen up a little bit. So what he's talking about is this process of new wine. The wine, sometimes they would keep it in jars, but most often in the home, they would keep it in a wine skin. And those old skins, by the time they were done with them, they were stretched to their capacity. So that meant that if you put the new wine inside of the old wine skin, and they were already stretched to their capacity, it would break. What I sensed in my spirit this morning when I was praying about this was this idea of new seasons, new seasons of life that replace old seasons. And I think sometimes when we're headed into a new season, it requires a new container. When you are growing spiritually, sometimes you will outgrow the container that you were in previously. Now, I don't know what that is for you. I've experienced this a couple of times in my life. Sometimes it's a job. Sometimes it's a friend group. Maybe it's a church. Maybe it's simply just a way of doing things. But what worked before is not going to work now because God is giving you new wine. There's a new anointing. There's a new assignment. And you can't allow the old containers to hold you back from the growth that God is doing in you. And I think sometimes we have this fear of letting go of the old container. Now, the old container served us well in the season that we were in. But if we continue to stay there, there's not going to be enough room within that container for the new anointing God is is pouring on us. And so that's a word for somebody. I don't know who it is for. Um, I sense that it is for probably a number of people, but it's just that's a freebie for you today. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be. To be. In the 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee L, the journey from point A to point B isn't such a rush. In fact, with three rows of spacious comfort, thoughtfully crafted luxurious design, and an available premium Macintosh audio system, you'll find yourself seeking out the scenic route more often, even if it's just another lap around the block. Jeep, there's only one. Visit Jeep.com to learn more. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC. But all of this is leading up to this this undercurrent that's bubbling in the heart of these leaders, and it's this idea of Sabbath. And so if you don't know, what the Sabbath was, was a day of rest. It would be on Saturday in their culture. Sabbath was on a Saturday. And they were upset because they didn't think that Jesus was observing the Sabbath. Again, it's another thing in this long list of grievances they have because they don't think he's acting the way that he should act. And so his response to them is interesting. And this is what we're going to park it at today. It says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, that word, son of man, sometimes it's referring to Jesus, but in their culture, son of man was kind of like a generic way also to just talk about humanity or humankind. But what I will say about this passage specifically to Jesus, apart from the claim of Jesus to be Messiah, this is the the most touchy subject where Jesus came under conflict with the religious leaders. It was under this idea of of observing the Sabbath and what that meant. And so what Jesus ends up doing is he puts himself in this position against the rabbis who are holding on tightly to these restrictions. And he's explaining that those restrictions that they're holding so tightly to is contrary to the spirit of God and the original spirit of the law of the Sabbath. 
because the law of the Sabbath was to bless humankind. And so the rabbis, they think that the Sabbath was the be all, the end all. That's the law. That's the rule. That's an institution you might want to call it. And that is if you are a strict Jew that is following the Israelite law, you are subject to observing that without exception above any and every all other interests. So in those words, what that would mean is that man was made for the Sabbath. And Jesus flips that on its head. Jesus is saying that the Sabbath was made for man's benefit, which means if there's a conflict between the human's needs, humankind's needs, and the strict adherence to the law of following the Sabbath, the needs of the human, the needs of mankind are higher than the need to observe the law of the Sabbath. Because what does Jesus say? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to bless humanity, not man made to observe the Sabbath. And so they've got it flipped. So essentially, what's that mean? That means that you do, first and foremost, what God is calling you to do before anything else. Again, everything hinges on your relationship with God. You know, as a as a pastor, I was a staff pastor for a long time, which meant I had to work on Sundays. If we followed the Sabbath principle to the letter of the law, well, first of all, Sabbath would be on Saturday instead of Sundays, because in our culture, in the American culture, for, for most of evangelical Christianity, for 90% of it, it's always on a Sunday. That's not to say there aren't Saturday services or, you know, there are some denominations that observe Sabbath on Saturday. But as a person that was called into full-time ministry, I could not take a Sabbath on Sunday. I worked all day on Sundays. And it wasn't just church. It was before church. It was after church. It was we had uh, discipleship classes. It was the youth group was in the evening. Like Sundays were a work day. We worked more on Sundays. That was like our go day. It was game time. And then we took our Sabbath on Mondays. If I was traveling, actually this weekend, I'm traveling for a mission trip and my flight leaves early, early Sunday morning. Well, God has called me on that mission trip. And so for me to be doing things on that mission trip on a Sunday, I'm not out of order because I'm doing that. Because what we're seeing here is Jesus is giving this example of something like dealing with the idea of hunger, self-hunger or feeding the hungry. That's taking precedence over this biblical principle of Sabbath rest. And so here, what Jesus is doing he is he's defending his disciples which, side note, I love that Jesus defends his disciples in, in the presence of a religious spirit. So if you're up against that, just have some encouragement that Jesus defends you in the midst of that. But essentially what this all boils down to is he's valuing human relationship over rules. I recently got an email from a listener and and she was so hurt because she said somebody in her life, and I think maybe she was a newer believer, but somebody in her life was adamant that the Sabbath had to be on Saturday to the point of costing some relational capital there, meaning there was some pain there over these conversations. And it was one of these issues that they were ready to die on this hill and it caused some damage to this relationship. I don't believe for one second that Jesus wanted that relationship damage. I think the enemy wormed his way in there and made this an argument when it didn't need to be an argument. The idea is the understanding that Jesus wants us to rest. That's the Sabbath principle. And so it's not that Jesus is discrediting this idea of Sabbath, this Sabbath principle where humankind needs an element of rest at the end of a week. That is something that's to bless us. I believe, and I say this all the time, rest is a weapon. That's not scripture, it's Jason Bourne, but I think it's it's still applicable. When we don't rest, when we don't take a day of rest to be with our family, to allow, allow our brains to recharge, all of those things, spend time with God, go to church, whatever it is, when we don't do that, it quickly leads to burnout. God made us. God loves us. I say this all the time. It's not that God is just our father. He's a good father. He wants us to rest. You know, I think about my teenagers. I have one that is in this busy, you know, social butterfly aspect of her life, which is great. I mean, that's what kids are supposed to do. But she has a tendency to go, 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 go. And if I don't force her to take a minute and rest, well, there's consequences. Her room's a mess. I mean, maybe homework hasn't gotten done. 
She hasn't spent time with her family. She might get run down and get sick just from exhaustion. I have to force her sometimes to make her rest. Now, does that mean that if she's sick, I won't let her go to the doctor or if there's something important going on, I won't let her do it. That's not what it means. It just means she might have to rest a different day. I think this idea of the Sabbath principle, the heart of the principle in the first place was God's heart. And I think when we are reading things like the law, especially the law, there are some denominations that would read everything completely literally except they do pick and choose because they don't poke their eyes out. You know, there's parts of scripture that say if your eye causes you to sin, poke it out. Well, very few people do that, but then they'll hone in on the Sabbath or something else that's a very legalistic aspect of the law. You have to take a step back and you have to look at that within context. What is the heart behind that rule? Was it protection? Was it to to speak to some aspect of your humanity? Was it to protect somebody else? What is the heart behind why God made that rule in the first place? And then that is the thing that we take into our lives today. The heart of God for us, what was the spirit of that rule? To say that Jesus shouldn't be healing somebody that desperately needs healed because it's a Sabbath is laughable. And anybody, I think now in our perspective, we can see that. How they didn't see that is a, it's a testimony to how far they've gone off track from God's heart. So I hope you remember that when we're talking about this Sabbath principle. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to reread starting at, what was it? Verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth into an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God, and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Another time when Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Let's pray. God, I pray against the stubborn hearts. Although our situations may be different than what the experiences were of Jesus and the disciples at the time with the Pharisees, I think sometimes we can come up against this religious spirit, either accusations from other people or even guilt that we put on ourselves. Lord God, help us to remember that there's grace found in you. There's grace found in you. That the point of the Sabbath principle was to bless us, not to imprison us. So Lord, I just pray for freedom for those that may have been bound with this religious spirit. Lord, would you help them to understand the freedom that they have in you? Lord, help our hearts to be aligned with your heart. Help us to see the things that you would cause us to see no matter what day of the week it is. Lord, I pray rest over my friends today, that if perhaps there are people that have not been giving themselves a day of rest, God, would you gently convict their hearts, not in a way where they would feel condemnation like the enemy would do, but in a way that draws them into closer relationship with you. God, I thank you that you are a good father and that you want us to rest our weary hearts so that we can be fully devoted to you and to be used by you in the way you intended. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
The Hearing Jesus Podcast is so excited to partner with Compassion International. We believe in Compassion's mission to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. I've seen the impact myself through the letters and the updates that I've received as a sponsor. It's not just changing the lives of children, it's changing entire families, whole communities, always through the local church and always in Jesus' name. When you sponsor a child, you ensure access to quality education, medical checkups, healthy food, clean water, and most importantly, the love of Jesus, delivered through a church in their community because of a generous, caring sponsor like you. And you can speak life, love, and hope to your sponsored child through personal letters that you'll exchange. I hope you'll join me in sponsoring a child through Compassion today. All you have to do is pull out your phone, open up a text, and text Hearing Jesus. Jesus to 83393. You'll get back a text with a picture of a child who is waiting for a sponsor and a link to sponsor that child. You can also go to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to choose a boy or a girl to sponsor. When you sponsor a child, we will send you a copy of She Hears Learning to Listen to Jesus, my Bible study, as a token of our thanks for investing in the life of a child. Thank you for joining me and sponsoring a child through Compassion today. Greetings and God bless. This is Tyler Burns. And this is Dr. Jamar Tisby. And we want to invite you to check out our podcast, Pass the Mic, Dynamic Voices for a Diverse Church. Pass the Mic has been speaking directly to the core concerns of Black Christians for over a decade. On our show, we've got interviews from theologians, historians, actors, activists, and so much more. Not to mention heartfelt, open dialogue on some of the heaviest issues facing the church in the United States. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there on the next Pass Pass the the Mic. My name's Preston Sprinkle, and I host the Theology in the Raw podcast. Theology in Raw aims to help believers to think Christianly about theological and cultural issues by engaging in curious conversations with a diverse range of thoughtful people. I have conversations with a wide range of different guests who come from different perspectives, and no topic is off limits. Sexuality, abortion, politics, LGBTQ, warfare, violence, marijuana, immigration, you name it. If you have a theological or cultural issue that you have been wrestling with, with over 1,100 episodes, we've probably talked about it on Theology in Raw. Along with conversations with various people, I also address questions sent in from my audience every month. And occasionally, I will talk about some of my latest research projects that I'm currently working on. Theology Nara is not for everyone. It is uncut, uncensored, and I don't give trigger warnings. So check out Theology Nara through your favorite podcast app.